the world of fashion was once the exclusive domain of a privileged handful who could afford the luxury of handmade clothes and the caprices of taste that could overnight make a wardrobe obsolete. Annually, its best dressed were carefully counted out on the fingers of two hands. But the pictures changed, democracy has triumphed, and among the inalienable rights of 60-odd million American women today is the right to be well-dressed. In pursuit of this ideal, they spend annually $16 billion on their wardrobes, and each hangs four and one-half new dresses in her closet. Today, she is without question the best dressed and most dressed woman in the world. Her sensible, casual approach to fashion and her vitamin-fortified good looks are envied, admired, and copied the world over. But the real secret of her success lay in that phenomenal tribute to Yankee ingenuity, the fashionable, well-made dress priced to sell at under $20. This, then, is a look at the dress that did for fashion what Henry Ford's car did for transportation. Huddled together in the 18 square blocks of New York City known collectively as 7th Avenue are the several thousand dress houses that produce most of what the American woman wears. One of the larger and most successful is Sue Brett, a firm that has built a $16 million business on a reputation for good fabric, good fit, and good fashion all for a very good price. The heart and head of the operation is Jack Baker, an energetic, volatile fellow who leaves nothing to chance, a man with a distinct flair for fabric and style, as well as a keen instinct for what will sell. The Sue Brett dress begins in a morning conference of Baker and his three designers. And it begins with the fabric, often cotton. Women have worn it for at least 7,000 years. In the beginning, it was a precious fabric. The fiber was hand-harvested, hand-spun, and hand-woven, a slow and costly operation. But in the 18th century, with the invention of the gin and the powered loom and spinning machine, it became possible to mass-produce cotton fabrics relatively inexpensively, and in a short time it became the most widely used apparel cloth. In the 1930s, textile designers took a fresh look at cotton and came up with ways to give it still more luster, new bold textures and brilliant permanent colorings. And the Cinderella of the kitchen went high fashion. A revolution in American clothing was taking place. The 19th Amendment had given women new freedom. They held jobs, they traveled, they took up sports, and fashion had to be functional. Cotton could be as practical as it was beautiful. It could be made water repellent, stain proof, wrinkle resistant. It could even be made to stretch. The designers at Sue Brett sketch and discard hundreds of ideas in the process of designing a new collection. Only the best are then translated into muslin. A little more than a hundred years ago, the whole idea of going into a store and buying a ready-made dress off a rack would have been inconceivable. In the first place, there was no such thing as standard dress sizes. Clothes were simply custom sewn to fit a particular person. But when the Civil War broke out and the government needed uniforms for its soldiers quickly and in quantity, 
A system of standard measurements to which uniforms could be cut was devised. After the war, the idea was adapted to civilian clothing for women as well as men. Today, size grading is an exact science. The subtlest figure variations can be fitted in a range of Mrs. sizes, junior sizes, petites, or half sizes. With the invention of the rotary cutting knife in 1895, the mass-produced ready-made dress became feasible. Now layers of cloth could be cut at one time, and the pattern pieces for a hundred dresses cut in the time it had once taken to cut one. Less fabric was wasted when the pattern pieces were carefully and economically arranged on the length of cloth. Now, all of this meant the per dress cost was lower. By the turn of the century, the stage was set. Elias Howe had invented the sewing machine 50 years earlier, and ready-made blouses and skirts were already appearing in stores. In 1908, some enterprising fellow sewed a blouse to a skirt, and the ready-to-wear dress was born. It was a technological triumph, but it wasn't fashion. Paris was still the fashion capital, and any woman worth her weight in Paris labels wouldn't have been caught dead in a store-bought dress. But when the First World War temporarily cut off the supply of French originals, America turned to its native designing talents, and a distinctive American fashion look began to emerge. By the late 1920s, ready-to-wear had become fashionably acceptable. Now working girls and society matrons rubbed elbows at department store dress racks. Twice a year, Sue Brett designs a brand new collection of dresses. And twice a year, buyers for department stores and shops converge on New York to stock their racks with the things they think the American woman will buy. A full season ahead, the fashion magazines and newspapers are preparing her for the things to come. A new silhouette, perhaps, a new color, a new fabric. Since the days of Godey's Ladies book, fashion editors have been selling her on the idea of new clothes, better clothes, more clothes. They've taught her what to wear and how to wear it. But despite the cry of some, editors cannot make fashion, for fashion changes are never arbitrary, but rather reflect the temper of the times. Not even the government could suppress the hobble skirt when it was felt the reduction in skirt fabrics would hurt the national economy. Like the weather, the only thing certain in fashion is that it will change. But a few years ago, Sue Brett decided to put in computers and approach the matter scientifically. Although Lloyds of London holds that it and horse racing are the only unpredictable things in the world, there is about fashion a sort of predictable unpredictability. And while no one expects a mere machine to forecast next season's new look, the computers can give general directions in color and style. And scanning initial orders, they tell Sue Brett how many dresses to cut and in what colors, thus increasing efficiency and preventing costly mistakes. So the dress that began as an idea in a conference six months ago is now a reality. American know-how and nature's cotton have helped to make it possible. A small miracle that's a steal at $20.